In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. In case you noticed from the collect this morning and some of our lessons, Psalm 23 and the gospel we just heard in particular, today is what church people call Good Shepherd Sunday. And of course, it relies upon that and rests upon that biblical image of Christ carrying his sheep, leading his sheep through the wilderness, and of course, Jesus as that good shepherd himself. Something that I noticed when I was looking at these lessons over the course of the week was how the Acts of the Apostles lesson looks instead of at the Good Shepherd, looks at the flock. Our lesson from Acts this morning takes a look at what it means to be that group of people who follow the Good Shepherd, the sheep who know the Shepherd's voice and follow him out of the sheepfold and out into the world where wherever he leads, really. In order to enter into this story myself, I, use a, I used this week a prayer technique that some of you all might be familiar with. It's called Ignatian prayer. Ignatius of Loyola was and is still a saint in the Roman Catholic Church. He lived in the 1600s in Spain and he is perhaps best known for founding the Society of Jesus, otherwise known as the Jesuits. They trained hard, and he wrote and developed this entire complete and complex training program for those seeking those religious orders. The training involved study, theological study and biblical study. It involved physical exercise for rigorous, rigorous training, and of course, it involved spiritual training. He compiled a variety of prayer methods, prayer techniques for Jesuits to follow in their daily lives. And one form in particular uses the imagination, uses the imagination to enter into those Bible stories that we hear over the course of our lives and over the course of the lectionary cycle to enter into them fully with our whole person, with our senses. One listens, first of all, to the story, and then one tries to imagine, closes one eyes and tries to imagine, what do I hear? What do I see? What do I smell or taste or touch? How do I feel emotionally, even? So it's this entering of the full person into the story. And the Gospels are, in particular, really wonderful scripture to do this with, but especially the stories in Luke and Acts. You see, Acts is pretty much Luke part two, and it's meant to illustrate the Acts of the Apostles doing what Jesus did, very much fully embodying his ministry in their ministry. And the author of Luke and Acts was writing for a Greek audience, and so he wrote it in a genre that they would be familiar with. So he used characters and fleshed them out fully and tried to tell the stories the way you might read in a novella. So there's a little bit more drama in Luke. So I entered into this story, and I ask you to join me in this fictional character that I have created and listen to a little bit of her story as she encountered the community of the risen Lord. My name is Lucretia. I was born in Jerusalem under the reign of the emperor Tiberius Caesar. The city was saturated with a mix of Jewish practices and Greek and Roman culture. There was worship in our temple, Shabbat each week, and high holy days. And these were all celebrated in the midst of Roman coins, Roman soldiers, 
statues of Greek and Roman gods. At home and in our synagogue, I heard Aramaic. In the market, it was Greek spoken and bartered in. Well, I married Bartolomeo, and our marriage was filled with joy. Our home quickly filled with children to the delight of our parents, and things were good. But one day, Bartolomeo was struck ill. Then my parents, his father, one of our children, they all died and quickly. A dark cloud fell upon our family. All that remained was me, my mother-in-law, and three of our beloved children. In their faces, I saw my husband's face, and I wept bitter tears. We had nothing now. We had no food. We were hungry. Was I to beg? Was I to sell myself? Would my young sons join the emperor's soldiers, sent far off, never to be seen again? My children were traumatized, and I was too exhausted even to grieve. But in the midst of that darkness entered a woman named Chloe. She came from a group of people who called themselves followers of the way. She was our light. I had heard of these people. They believed that a criminal, an enemy of the Roman state, one who challenged the emperor's kingship, who boldly argued with the corrupt temple leaders, they believed that this criminal had died and yet lived again. I even heard that they ate his flesh and drank his blood, and I wondered with my friends if they might be cannibals. But Chloe was nothing like that, nothing like anything I expected, really, and neither were her friends. In these dark times, they rejoiced. They prayed together, they worshiped together, but unlike the Greek cults, it didn't end there. They really cared for each other with the same exuberance that was evident in their songs. They broke bread together. But unlike the Essenes I'd heard about in the wilderness who kept to themselves, or the Greeks who divided men and women, slaves and free, rich and poor, this group, Chloe's people, reached out to people like me. Everyone, she said, was welcome at this table, where none went without, and each received according to their need. Well, this seemed really strange to me. I once asked Chloe why they did these things, and she said that her God demanded her to serve those people like me and my children, the widows and orphans, those forgotten, those at the edges, so they brought us food, they brought us medicine, they treated us as if we had something of their God in us. It was really strange how they did all this with an effusive joy, joyful obedience, they called it. But it was not a slave-like obedience. It was an obedience that listened and responded to their God. To be honest, these people surrounded these people sounded so much like those ideal friendships and communities that I knew from Greek philosophers, people like Plato and Ovid. I guess I wasn't the only one because Gentiles like me became part of their community. A Greek man named Philip even formed a group of leaders to serve as diakonia, deacons. And that's what Chloe was, a deacon. You know, now that I think about it, this community of followers of the way seemed strangely infused with a power so unlike the emperor's power. You know, the emperor's good news was full of violence. Stories of military conquests and prisoners of war paraded through the streets. So it's so ironic to me that this group uses the same word, good news, but it's not filled with violence with loving kindness. 
She says that all are loved because this man named Jesus, they believe, loved them first. Well, I guess I too have become one of them, really, one of these followers of the way. So that was just one person's exploration, going in with my imagination into what it might have been like to encounter this earliest and perhaps most ideal expression of Christian life. This kind of account is certainly not this kind of uh, community that was ideal rolling off of this first uh, revelation of Christ being risen from the dead follows in pattern with many such ideals the Bible describes. Because throughout the Bible, with every revelation of God's love or covenant with God's people to live according to God's ways, the people do that, and very well at first, and then they fall away. Because let's face it, Paul was right when he said that the way of the cross is foolishness to many. Last week, the writer Rachel Held Evans reminded the clergy of this diocese that, well, the Bible is kind of weird. And we have to hold on to that weirdness and because being Christian is, well, weird sometimes. And we see that illustrated in the idealism of this story that is so, at once so beautiful and terribly uncomfortable. I don't know about you, but it makes me uncomfortable and I feel like that's what the gospel calls us to be, uncomfortable. But this ideal is God's ideal. It has a claim on us, on you and on me. And it is reborn each generation in a new form and in different churches all over the world. We see it, for example, in movements like monasticism or following saints like Francis in the Reformation of the Church. And this morning at the nine o'clock service, we heard about how it is born here in St. James's in our very own Children's Center, how we give back from what we have so freely received from Jesus, that beauty and that grace and that love, we give it back. Why? Why does this keep being reborn? Because the Holy Spirit continues to live in some mysterious way in us. Children of God continue to be baptized into the mystery of Christ, into the mystery of the Trinity, and thereby charged like those of our early church in our, in our baptismal covenant, our own baptismal covenant repeats those words from Acts of the Apostles that we are to continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, in the breaking of the bread and in the prayers, that we're to proclaim the good news and respect the dignity of all. For in there is found this strange yet powerful spirit, a liveliness we sometimes call eternal life or maybe kingdom of God. We follow the one who calls us, the one who knows each of us by name. We follow that one because we recognize his voice and thereby we are marked as his flock. And so we shall continue to follow and again and again and again until our Lord and Savior returns for good. Amen.